I'm Scott Sandell, as you just heard, and it's great to be back at Slush. I think it's my fourth or fifth time here. It's always a wonderful gathering. I love the vibe here. I love the community feeling in Europe and the venture community. We used to have that in the US. I don't know if it's still there. <laughs> but um, you know, I've been involved in some, some really successful companies and an awful lot of companies that didn't work out so well, and I learned a lot from both of them. Uh, but what I see with Unifor is that this is a company that's on track to be one of the the great gener generational uh, enterprise software companies. We were fortunate enough to get involved in Unifor about three years ago, uh, and I joined the board recently uh, as part of the most current funding round. But I've been working with the Mesh very closely ever since we met about four years ago. Um, and one of the most remarkable things to me about a Mesh is its ability to build relationships. He asked me when we first met, he said, Scott, um, I'd like to meet with you, even though you're not on the board, I'd like to meet with you every quarter. And I said, mm, okay, but I live in Florida and he lives in California, how is that gonna work? And he said, don't worry, I will come to you wherever you are. And at the time I wasn't really sure whether he would do that or not, but he's done it every single quarter since that time. And we've had incredible conversations. Um, I, you know, one of the things I look for in entrepreneurs is people who understand what they're good at, understand what they still need to learn, and are open to coaching. Uh, Umesh is definitely one of those. Uh, we have um, you know, one of the greats of Silicon Valley, John Chambers, on the board. Uh, he's also a great mentor to Umesh. And before I invested, John's the one who introduced me to the company. And so uh, that was one of the things he said about Umesh. He said, Umesh has that potential to be one of the great ones. And a key, key reason for that is he's, he's really coachable. So think about that if you're an entrepreneur. That's what, that's what venture capitalists are, are really looking for. But we're here today to talk about an incredible transformation of this company, even since we met the company four years ago. But I want to just go back uh, to, the, to the beginning of this company because, uh, as you all know, you, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. And this is, of course, one of the hottest enterprise AI companies on the planet. So when do you think it started? It started in 2008 with a $100,000 grant uh, in an IIT Madras innovation lab. I've seen a video of this whole or origin story. It's quite incredible. And in 2019, Umesh and his co-founder Ravi moved the company to Silicon Valley in order to start expanding in the US market. They have 1,800 enterprise customers around the world, and they were focused on call centers. Uh, but since that time, that's a plenty big enough market. But uh, what's happened since that time is that Umesh and Ravi are transforming this company into a company which can serve the entire enterprise with AI-based uh, applications. And that's what we want to talk to you today about. How do you go from starting with a very focused enterprise software company and moving to an enterprise platform company? Uh, there are very few companies that have done that well. Uh, Umesh is very well on track to do it. So Umesh, I'm curious, you know, we have this, this saying at NEA, uh, the only advantage of the startup is focus. And you and Ravi stayed really focused for a long time, even though you were evolving. Can you tell us a little bit about that early journey for the company? Well, Scott, thank you for that introduction. It's great to be with you all here. My first time at Slush, and it's an honor to be with Scott Sandel on stage. Uh, in the introduction, Scott said a few things, one of which is truly important to me, building relationships. What you're all going to observe today is also an important relationship, one between a board member and a CEO. And for all young founders and CEOs, this is a very important relationship to harness. So you're going to see us disagree a few times. <laughs> you're going to see us you know, uh, uh, finish each other's sentences and show chemistry, et cetera. But if what Scott and I say here today in the next 20 minutes, everyone agrees with us, we wouldn't have done our job. We want to share ideas. We want to share stories, what has worked for us, mistakes made along the way. And there's a long road ahead. So Scott, to your point, Unifor is in a very fascinating place today. Relative to when I started this company 16 years ago, today we are an end-to-end -end AI company, and we became the first to deliver an enterprise AI cloud to thousands of enterprise customers around the world, the biggest telecom companies, the biggest 
uh, banks, et cetera. And if I think back in the journey of how that has happened, how these large enterprises have given us the license to do business with them, to deploy our product and technology in their businesses, a big part of it is that we've stayed maniacally focused on what's important to our customers. Every company must list down its cultural values, so has Unifor, and our number one cultural value is customer first. And here's what it means. A lot of companies have that value. Here's what it means at Unifor. That each time we get into a room and have a debate of should we do A or B, it could be financial decision, it could be product decision, it could be a country decision, et cetera. It always, the answer always comes down to what's right for our customers mm -hmm. and what will make them more successful. And so thinking about this issue of focus versus continuously developing innovation and platform and, and new features, I have never seen in my career in technology, and I've been an entrepreneur for over 20 years with the company prior to Unifor, I have never seen the pace of innovation in the whole industry being as fast as it, as it is today. When I started my career, the common wisdom, the common advice that VCs or board members would give founders like me is that once you pick your strategy, stay true to it for at least three to four years and execute on it. Then we saw in the last decade, companies like Tesla and others start to disrupt major industries that had not innovated for a long period of time. And now in the era of generative AI, hardly 48 hours are going by without a major breakthrough or innovation in how these technologies are moving. So the pace of innovation has really shifted in the last couple of years relative to what we knew how to build companies 10 years ago. And so if you think about, well, on the one side, you have to be focused, you have to stay connected to your customers and deliver value, but at the same time, the industry is moving. How do you balance the two? I don't see these two at being loggerheads to each other. Because the way we've cracked this puzzle at Unifor is one of two things. The first one is when you launch a new product or feature or platform to your customers, the whole culture, right from me to every engineer in the company to professional services to sales, everyone's focused on making sure our user, because in the enterprise, the buyer and the user might be two different people, mm -hmm. that our user is ultimately successful, they find the software easy to use, and whatever business outcome that was designed for that, mm -hmm. they're achieving it. And in doing so, you're constantly listening and tweaking what is working for them, what needs to change, and you're pushing yourself and your engineering team to be very rapid with that innovation. But the second one, which is less understood in early stage startup, if you look behind all these large companies, and I see Google right behind us here on stage, that's a great example of a company that applied the second rule that I'm going to talk about very effectively, which is while staying focused to your customers, a big form of innovation is stay very attentive to removing friction in your own process because that's when scaling happens. Mm. And if you think back in the mid-2000s, there were two companies way before anybody else who were solving their own needs by creating data centers and technologies that only they needed. Hmm. One of them was Google because they wanted to deliver a frictionless search experience at a scale that nobody else had done before. Hmm. And the other one was an e-commerce retail company called Amazon that wanted to deliver a seamless experience in their business that nobody had done before. That forced them to create infrastructure and software in data centers, which when cloud occurred, positioned them at the top position to lead the cloud race. And at Unifor, our journey has been no different. Nobody prior to us had deployed AI or Gen AI for 1,500, 1,800 customers, which means we are orchestrating 1,800 models at the same time in our infrastructure. Nobody prior to us had handled data on behalf of our clients at that scale. And so we were solving all these problems for ourselves mm -hmm. And as the market opened up, as Gen AI came to forefront and enterprises have started to adopt it in the last two years, that has put Unifor at the forefront because our platform had solved some of the biggest problems for our clients. I think a related question that maybe you're addressing in a certain way, Amesh, is this idea that 
you know, you shouldn't listen to your customer. That's sort of the, you know, Steve Jobs thought a little bit that way. Henry Ford, I think, said, you know, if I listened to my customers, they would have told me to invent a faster horse-drawn buggy or something. So how do you think about envisioning a future rather than just listening to the customer and trying to solve the things they tell you about? Well, Scott, what you're leading me at is one of the most important aspects of scaling an enterprise software company, period, of any kind. First and foremost, you need to earn the privilege to establish a strong relationship with key stakeholders mm -hmm. in those companies. They have to start seeing you as a trusted advisor, not just a seller of product, a seller of feature, mm -hmm. a seller of platform. And that takes effort. Just like, Scott, you mentioned our story, I invest the same energy and time in meeting my customers, the CIOs, the CEOs that we sell to, and these are Fortune 500 company executives who are flying around the world, and I go to extraordinary lengths mm -hmm. to make sure I am able to meet them where they are able to meet me. Yeah. And what this does is over time, it builds trust. Of course, your product has to deliver value, your company has to do what it promises to do, but over time, people buy from people. And those relationships are important. Now as you establish that relationship, it gives you an opportunity to constantly listen to what are the key priorities for your customer. Mm -hmm. What are the top three business challenges that they're solving for at any given point of time? That's a question I'm always asking them over meals or coffee, that what are your key goals? What are the key challenges? How can I help? There are things that I can do at Unifor. And, and, and you didn't say what are your key technical problems, you said what are your key business issues? That's truly important. What I'm not after, is what's the next software you're gonna buy or what feature you want me to develop? Because that's my job to think on their behalf. What I'm after is what are your top three challenges? Are you going after efficiency or EBITDA gains? Mm -hmm. Is Wall Street telling you that your AI strategy is not aligning with your peer group and you need to, to accelerate that? Mm -hmm. Or if you have a problem that you believe your CIO isn't doing a great job, and what you're really saying is you need acceleration in roadmap and you think your current management team isn't is in, uh, scaling up. So I'll give two very quick examples here to bring this to life. Because as a founder over years, the best way I learned was listening to stories of how you know, other CEOs were doing this. So first, a major telecom client in the US. Their CIO has a over five years relationship with me personally. We've had several meals together. We've had bumps together. Sometimes our software hasn't delivered to expectation and I was always there addressing him. And other times he's won awards and got promoted in his job because of what we did for him. And so I remember middle of last year, Scott, as Gen AI had taken forefront, every company was looking to go to Wall Street in their next earnings cycle mm -hmm. and talk about here's our Gen AI strategy, here's our biggest partnership that we've announced, et cetera. The CIO called me from California to the, their office in, in New Jersey and we sat down face to face and he said, Amesh, our relationship is so important, I need to tell you this that we have committed ourselves to driving this company's digital transformation using Gen AI, and that will lead us to fine tuning of LLMs with our own data, mm -hmm. because we think that's gonna create intellectual property, and which would mean that we will end using several SaaS applications. And that might impact your SaaS application as well, Omesh. And I go, you, you certainly didn't call me all the way from California to New Jersey to say I'm gonna get fired. You could have sent me a letter or an email. Why am I really here? And he said, Omesh, you're really here because in this new strategy, while I've committed to the board, I've committed to my CEO, we're facing challenges, we're facing friction in scaling this. We've done a lot of POCs, cool demos have been shown, but to industrialize across my company, I have a team of 50 data scientists we're working with a major LLM provider. We are fine tuning it. But each time we want to do three things together, one fails. And our hope is Unifor, you've been in the business of AI, you have thousands of customers, you've done this for 16 years. Mm -hmm. Our hope is you can help us figure out this roadmap and accelerate this, the word he used to industrialize Gen AI across the whole company. What he wasn't saying is build me the next cool feature mm -hmm. on your SaaS app he was really so, uh, telling me his business problem. And I had that privilege because it was a five year deep relationship. Imagine if Unifor wasn't even in this account, I would have never known the shift that they're going from SaaS to in-house LLM. Obviously since then what we've done is delivered a four layer cake architecture, which is a combination of data lake, 
knowledge lake, model lake, and agentic AI on top. And this is an architecture that they've rolled out across their entire organization. As an example, you listen to the problem of the customer, you don't listen for advice on what next to build. Mm. And I'll give a second example which is completely different. A major chairman CEO of one of the biggest retail consumer companies in the US saw me speak at a similar conference in New York City. He was in the audience. He sent me a mail that evening and he said, I couldn't shake your hand before you left, but a lot of examples you gave on stage, Amesh, are truly important to me. Can we get on a call? We had no relationship with his business prior. I saw his title, I said, of course I'm getting on a call with you. Are you available tomorrow? Mm. So we exchanged cell numbers, I get on the call, and he says to me, Amesh, you gave me examples of your telecom client and your banking client and your insurance client. I started my business in the dot-com era and we disrupted a physical infrastructure company. I am paranoid that somebody is disrupting me right now with AI hmm. and I'm not moving fast enough. So we have identified 30 major initiatives to convert our business to AI. Mm -hmm. But I think I needed a different role. My CIO is only stuck on the first one for the last six months. So I'm thinking of creating a different persona. Once again, what was he telling me? He wasn't saying his CIO is right or wrong. He wasn't looking for advice. He was really telling me he needs acceleration. He needs velocity and he needs help. Mm -hmm. While doing that, I've also learned in all these years that if on that call I would have told him, you're probably right, your CIO is not the right one. <laughs> the CIO would have used every tool eventually to make sure we fail in the account. Right. So what did I do? I told this gentleman, I said, I, I think we can help you with velocity. We've done it for several others. Allow my team to do a half a day workshop and now we do big business with them. But I also said, can you hold on to this decision of CIO versus chief AI officer up until we finish our workshop? I've, I think that you will have a better answer emerging. It may not be a person issue, it may be a platform issue that you're going after. So going back to the point, how do you listen intently to what your customers are trying to tell you? First, earn the right that they open up. Yeah. And once they do open up, how do you become their trusted advisor? How do you really solve their deep problems? And over time, that's how you, that leads to big business in these enterprises. So let's turn our attention for a second, and Mesh, we don't have that much time left, but there's one really important thing you've done that I haven't seen too many people do before, and that's M&A. You know, things have been changing so rapidly for Unifor in the last four years that you haven't built all of the components of this architecture and this solution that you just described. Can you just tell us how you got to the point, first of all, where you thought that was the right answer? What did you do to make that work? And what would you recommend to entrepreneurs who are thinking about that? Well, on this one, Scott, I'll say that there are two major themes where Unifor has been unconventional relative to common wisdom of building startups from Series A to now we are Series F. We are late stage. The first conventional wisdom that exists in Silicon Valley, and you know what I'm talking about, Scott, is advice to young founders is when you launch something new, do not go and sell it to the large Fortune 500. That might be the kiss of death. Go sell it to a high-tech adopter of cool technology closer to your, to your hometown or business and learn with them. Unifor has been the reverse. Each time we launch something new, we go to our largest clients and ask them to almost be a co-development partner and join us in an advisory board capacity and help us fine tune that product. What that has done is given us the belief that if we solve a problem for the largest bank in the US or the largest telecom company or the largest insurer, we're probably building a wide enough platform that will have implication for a much broader market. And with that mindset, in the last four years, we've really flipped a switch in our head. Like I mentioned earlier, we've seen this pace of innovation, the pace of decision making accelerate in these companies. Unlike anything I've seen in my career. The same CIO who one month ago would tell me, we're going to use one major LLM and we're going to fine tune all our data and make that LLM as the brain of the enterprise. Mm. A month later called me and said, I've changed my mind. We're changing from a large language model to several small language models. Mm. And this shift of strategy, this shift of pace has forced us to think that there is a massive window of opportunity if we want to be the defining enterprise AI cloud, 
for all enterprises across the world, we understand this vision. We understand what these enterprises are looking for. They're looking for toolkit that can scale things very fast, that can take the, the complexity of dealing with multiple LLMs or SLMs behind the scenes so that they don't need an army of data scientists. There's a platform that's taking care of that complexity. And they also need help in managing a lot of unstructured data. So the vision that we painted is very vast, but we also realized that the window of opportunity will not stay open forever. Mm -hmm. And that has forced us in the last four years to shift our strategy. For the first 10 years of Unifor, like any other good engineering-led, product-led software company, we had a lot of pride of ownership. If it wasn't built at Unifor, we weren't proud of selling it. Hmm. In the last four years, we've had to train ourselves to think differently. That what's right for our customers is we deliver our entire vision at the shortest amount of time as possible and deliver value. And that has forced us to look at partnerships and M&A much earlier than traditional companies. Typically, Silicon Valley tells its companies, you know, M&A is a tool that public companies or much larger companies have utilized. I think we were Series C when we did our first acquisition. Mm -hmm. To date, we've done five. And the playbook we've adopted, it helps to have people like John Chambers on the board, who at Cisco had done 180 acquisitions, a lot of them majorly successful. But the playbooks that we've adopted is that acquisitions or finding the right companies requires a certain discipline. You're looking for products that match the architecture of your platform. Because if that doesn't match, then you're going to accumulate a lot of tech debt. You're looking for companies that have a go-to-market that matches yours. If you're selling to the enterprise and the company you're acquiring is selling to mid-market, that won't work either. And finally, looking for compatibility of company culture. It doesn't matter what your culture is. There is no right or wrong. But Oracle, Netflix, Cisco, each company had a very unique culture. And if the company that you're looking to acquire doesn't match that culture, there's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So it requires the discipline to make sure never fall in love with the target, make sure you're disciplined. But that's probably the easier part. The harder part is integrating those businesses to drive the ROI mm. that you believe that the two companies are going to drive. And so we decided early on that the person who heads corporate development or acquisitions is not going to be the one who heads integration. We have a completely different person reporting right up to me mm -hmm. who owns integrations. For each acquisition, we lay down and we tell the board before we do the acquisition what our key goals are. And then every month and every quarter, we track all those key goals on how do we integrate go-to-market. We get one sales team very quickly. How do we integrate platform? The engineering teams get six months mm -hmm. to get platforms integrated. And how do we get in front of customers and inspire them with the fact that we now have a much broader offering for them, and here's the value. But the one final thing I'll say about this is the founder CEO of our very first company that we acquired was a company in Valencia, Spain. We still have a big office there. And her name was Maria. And so on, on her honor, and she's still playing a key part in Unifor, we created a Maria rule in Unifor. And the Maria rule is that in the first 12 months of an acquisition, Whatever people decision we make, who's going to stay, who's going to move, who's going to be promoted, if it's on the acquired side of the company, the founder CEO of the incoming company has a veto right in the first year. And that builds trust with everybody. Wow, I love that. The Maria rule. Amesh, we're running out of time. One parting piece of advice, actionable advice for the CEOs and founders in the audience. Well, I'll be very quick, and then I want to quickly open this up for you as well, because Scott, you have seen companies way beyond Unifor. My final advice is, whether you're early stage or late stage, I always think about founders who should have a vision of a company that's much larger than what you're doing today. You should have a vision of having a standalone public company, which is a large cap company. You might have an M&A outcome in the middle, but building companies with that vision is truly important. But Scott, very quickly, back to you. Well, I love that idea. That's what we look for, by the way, when we find looking for new entrepreneurs, new portfolio companies. I just want to remind you the three things we talked about. We talked about focus. Focus is the only advantage of the startup, especially early on. We talked about listening to your customer. Let your customer tell you what their problems are, developing a, develop a trusting relationship with them so they really tell you what 
their problems are business problems as well as technical problems. But don't look to your customer to tell you how to solve those solutions. It's your job to come up with the technology roadmap to do it. And thirdly, in this day and age where there's so much change, don't expect that you will necessarily build all the code or all the product you need uh, to build out that vision. Look to m and I think it's a unique time in history. There's a lot of stuff available and it can be done even as a private company. So thank you so much, Amesh, for being with us. He flew all the way from California to be here today. Big round of applause. Thank you all for being here as well. <laughs>